Okay. Hi, everyone. We are happy to have Tolga Birdal with us today. Um, currently, Tolga is a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford University with the geometric computing group of Professor Leonidas Guibas. He did his work, PhD work, in computer vision group at TU Munich, TUM. And he co-authored several publications at prestigious conferences such as NeurIPS, CVPR, ICCV, ECCV, IROS, ICAST, and 3D Vision. Today, he will talk about learning on 3D representations with applications to camera object pose estimation and registration. We are very happy to have Tolga with us today. Go ahead, Tolga. Microphone is yours. Yeah, thanks, Fatma. It's actually a great pleasure. I mean, there are several faces here that I, I personally know, but never got the chance to chance to talk uh, on a technical topic together, or at least in a, in, a, in a group environment. So that's great. Um, let me share my slides. Go ahead. So some, some of these slides are, are newly added. So apologies if, if there are any mistakes already. That's okay. And let's let's do this in an interactive manner. So please ask the questions as, as, as we go along. I would also ask you like to ask you a couple of questions if that's okay with you. Okay, cool. So I'm not gonna do overviews or, 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 or anything. Let's let's just get into the topic. So because I mean the time is short anyway, I think. Um, of course, we will be talking about machine learning, right? And uh, and this is all we all, all we work now. So the, back then it was geometric modeling and then more op optimization, other type of things. But now machine learning is is really uh, taking the flag. So um, yeah, the, I will exp I will be explaining anything in the context of machine learning, hopefully. So the machine learning that that we know traditionally is of course applied mostly on images, audio, and text, right? And this is arguably the, the, the most common data modality around. So there are plenty of um, data sets available in those modalities and so on. Right? And what we do in machine learning, we have this input, right, somehow. And then we have the output space. And output space is usually composed of, you know, of tasks like, uh, or, or, or you know, maybe a label space, if you want, that's also called, that there are certain labels, right? It could be a classification, it could be a regression, or it could even be generative modeling in the sense that we are interested in, in generating the input data, or things that are similar to input data, um, right? And, and all these things, if, if, you, if you look at them, they are kind of Euclidean. So, so first of all, the input is Euclidean in the sense that it's always gridded or binned, like, like the pixels of an image. And the output space, uh, that's also interesting. Actually, on, on neural networks, we don't have much constraints on, on what the output looks like. So it could the, the entire neural network can take any value, right? any value that you want, um, and there are no restrictions on it. And of course, the restrictions comes when you when you normalize and, and, and so on. But but usually, the entire architecture is unrestricted. So I would I would call this output space also Euclidean, right? So of course, due to the universal approximation theorem, we could only interpolate uh, of in the in the in the label space maybe. But um, from a theoretical perspective, there is no barrier, you know, in front of regressing a very large number for it. There's no explicit treatment of this. And optionally, we have labels. Sometimes, you know, we, we tell the computer that there are dogs and there are cats. And we want this machinery. Of course, when these labels are available, it's called the supervised learning scenario. When they are unavailable, it's unsupervised learning. And, and what, what we seek to find is this heavy machinery called the neural network that well approximates the output given the input based on you know, certain parameters and the architect F, basically. OK, that's, that's good in itself. right? There are many works, and I cannot really talk to you about this, because you probably know maybe better than me already. And uh, though we will be speaking of 3D data, right? so how to, how to do these things in, in 3D. And 3D data is, you see it everywhere now, right? From, from Google Earth 
or Google Street View to medical imaging and autonomous driving or industrial inspection tasks. There are many, many places where 3D is actually used. So this is, this is great. But we are not very much prepared for processing 3D data with those architectures. Right? So it's true that people were, were working on deep learning since 50s or 60s, right? Or neural networks at least. But 3D neural networks or, or, or handling 3D data is just really new, right? It doesn't have such a history. So how does this data come? Well, you know, you, when, you, when you want images or photographs, you just take a 2D camera and, and go out and take a shot. And that's your 2D image, right? It's very easy. And 3D is now as, just as easy, just as easy um, as, a, as a 2D image, right? You, you take a 3D camera and, and capture that, that, that scene and you get a 3D model immediately. Right? So thanks to these advances in, in, in commodity sensors, basically. Okay, so how can we acquire this 3D data? You know, it, there are there are many 2D cameras. Are there are there you know a lot of 3D cameras available? Yes, there are of course. So there are active stereo sensors where you project the pattern to the world and then observe it with a couple of cameras and then do the pattern matching and, and extract the 3D. And there's the time of flight where we, we measure the well these sensors actually have measure the time of flight of a chunk of pixels on the sensor. Um, right, so they, they send the signal to the world and then and then measure the time that it comes back to compute the depth. And then there are lidar sensors, and these work essentially with similar principles, but but they change in in their way of scanning environments. And there are laser scanners where a, where a laser beam is 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 projected along a sphere to the world and, and the data is, is, is captured that way. And we can, we can artificially augment the real world with certain markers and then measure their positions. So this is called photogrammetry. There are actually more ways to acquire 3D. I did not even speak of medical imaging or volumetric acquisition, right? All these things are, are for acquiring points from the scene. Cool, so we have, we have many ways and therefore we have many, many data modalities as you see, right? Uh, I mean, I did not even really uh, get into certain aspects such as the, the surface of projection. So for instance, when we have a camera, like a 2D camera, right? We are projecting the world onto a plane. So this is like our eyes, right? But we don't need to do this. I mean, this is not a must. So we can actually project the world to a sphere, for instance, like the laser scanners will do. And certain animals uh, also replicate that behavior. Or we could have many, many planes of projection and then capture the world onto these many planes and somehow work with these different planes, right? And like, like, like the like insects or, or some bugs. Right? In fact, you can imagine very fancy projection surfaces and somehow, sometimes these are, these are essential for, for, for instance, high accuracy, high quality data acquisition, right? But which, what is the best, surface of projection is kind of unknown even, right? So you see that, that even with the surface, the, the projection surface, everything changes, but there are also, you know, we can, we can acquire this through time. We, can, we could speak of other type of data modalities such as probability distributions. We don't need to be continuous. We could, we could, be, dis, we could be discrete and, and say that, you know, the data that I have is, it has, a, has an underlying graph structure or such, such as molecules, for instance, or other things, right? And, or you can, you can think of general manifolds or surfaces in higher dimensional spaces and, and, and or functions on, on these things. So we have this, this now kind of non-Euclidean data, right? And essentially we are interested in finding certain things. So let's say regressing certain elements. And these elements also have certain structure, like right? We are interested, for instance, in correspondence estimation, right? Not every matrix you can imagine is a correspondence matrix. A correspondence matrix might be a soft, but uh, but you know, um, like a like a like a double stochastic matrix, for instance, right? Where there's a high probability of assignment from from one point to the other. Um, or camera poses, they are also geometrically structured, right? So, so the rotation is a three by three matrix, 
but not every three by three matrix is a rotation. And therefore, there's a certain structure to the elements that, that we are uh, regressing, right? So there's a certain underlying geometry of that. So, you know, how do we, how do we know this? How, well, how do we, why do we seek these parameters? Well, because we have been as humans doing philosophy and mathematics for years and years. And this is how we represent the world essentially. And just because of these large set of priors, we have a lot of information to feed to this network. It's not in the context of data, but it's in the context of maybe intellect. Right? Now, now we would like to basically process this non-Euclidean data in the light of, of the, in the light of basically this, this, these priors or this geometric information that we have built before. And that way we can maybe find interesting mappings that would map these non-Euclidean surfaces to other non-Euclidean surfaces, right? Which I call outputs. So we are looking for this, what Jan Koenderin calls this differential geometry engine, basically, that bridges these two things together. Cool. So this brings interp interpretability as well. And here is what I mean by that. This is, this is I think this is important to, to keep in mind when we speak of the, also of the dangers of deep learning, by the way. So consider the following example. I want to go from A to B, and there's a line here, this blue line. I want to touch this line. So I first want to travel to the line to a point X, and from X, I would like to go to the point B, okay? This is called the famous Heron's problem. The, the question is, where is X? Okay, and uh, so how would you solve this problem? Any guesses? What would you do? And tell me if the question is not clear, I can repeat. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Write the Euclidean distance between A and B in terms of X and minimize it. That is true, right? This is, I would say, the calculus way. Yes, right? <laughs> I'm the calculus way. <laughs> I would say this is the calculus way. So um, I would use a string and attach them to A, B, uh -huh. and put some weight on the string, kind of pushing it down and relax it. I see. Of, like, there is a physical solution for you. Okay, there's a physical solution as well. It's even more sophisticated. Um, okay, great, great. Um, this is the, this is so this is the this is the let, let, let me just exemplify from the calculus solution right so we write the, you write these Euclidean distances to these points and then uh, oh, and I'm, I'm here admitting that the line the, the, the y coordinate of the line is zero for simplicity and therefore one of the coordinates drops so we just need to solve for this x1 position so the first coordinate of that uh, of that point and what we do is basically uh, as said, we take the derivative and equate it to zero, and the solution uh, of this optimization will basically give us that point. So this is great, right? So we have a super, super elaborate hammer to attack any type of problem, right? And this is when, when calculus came and when calculus actually, you know, back in ages proposed this, people were, uh, people were really shocked by it a little bit, right? Just, just like we are shocked by, by, the, by the power of deep networks. But then there were these geometers, they were saying, you know, but it, that doesn't say anything about the points. So you, you give me an equation, but you tell me nothing. And what they meant by this is the following. So we go back to the Heron's solution, the, you know, the ancient solution of this problem. What he says basically, uh, and let me see if I can actually annotate that slide. Um, so what he says is, so this here is, let me see. Um, okay, just a moment. Ne never mind, sorry, but, but I can, you can see my mouse, right? Yes. Okay, so here is the, um, here's the solution. 
let's let's say uh, that the distance between A and B, because I'm touching X, should be the summation of this green line and, and that green distance, right, both. So actually, that distance, the minimal, minimum distance, wouldn't change if I were to shift B or, or move B around a circle, right, around the circle. So the sum of the distances would be the same. A, a circle that, that has the radius of, of the, the distance from X to B. Well, what is the distance between two, two points? The shortest distance between two points, so it's the line. So then actually that distance should be the smallest when there is a straight line from A to B. So what I can do, I can reflect B along this axis to here to B prime such that the distance to x to b prime is the same as x to b, okay? And then I can draw a straight line from a to b prime. And the point that this line intersects the blue line will be the optimum point, right? So this is, this is very little calculation. At the same time, there's a very, Inform it's a very informative solution in the sense that we know what we are doing. And so people were telling, uh, so, so right now what, what people tell deep, deep learning people that things are not interpretable, we don't know what's going on, is actually the same thing as the geometers are, are telling the calculus people, hey, your solution did not inform me about anything. And this is not to be afraid of, of course. It did not diminish the value of calculus. The calculus is still the most important fundamental tool, right? But it also did not diminish the, the, the contribution of geometry. And both of them still survive to this date. So, you know, apparently there's a bridge. And how do we do that? So how do we, how do, we do this bridge for, for 3D, right? And let's go back to the, the what I mean by 3D, actually, everything starts from there, right? What is 3D? So it's strange. Unlike 2D images, there is no industry standard for representing those things. And therefore, um, we experiment with different representations right now. And in fact, if memory was not an issue, right? The, 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 there were no memory constraints in the world. I would say a voxel grid would be the best standard solution because it can be, it would be able to represent any point cloud up to any resolution. But now we are limited by the memory and most of the, when, if you think of our environments, most, most of these voxels or most of the space is just empty. So there has to be better representations than that, right? And I divide these representations, the input representations, by the way, these representations are not in context of representation theory, where there's a certain latent point, right? These are input representations. And I divide them into two, irregular and regular. So the irregular part is, is, is when we really cannot grid things in a, in a structured way. Regular, can, we can, things can be gridded in a structured way, and, but the function that is represented could be different. It could be an occupancy. It could be, um, I don't know, maybe some multi-view images of that object or, or or a distance field, anything. And we can use octaries to represent it as well, um, or, or to store that. And uh, the irregular parts, point clouds or meshes fall into this category or, or graphs in general, right? And, and we have those, we have to work with these representations. Okay, so let's look at how we acquire 3D data, at least you know, in, in context of some machine vision or commodity computer vision applications, right? We have this scanner, like a Kinect. We go to the world and, and take a snapshot and that's a depth image. So that's a projection to the plane of the depth values, right? And uh, this is one modality. Or we can take that sensor and move it around the object and run some algorithm like Kinect Fusion that will fuse the different depth, uh, depth information from, from different viewpoints into a, um, into a maybe you know, self-contained 3D model. And we could do the laser scanning directly. This would give us point clouds or points in space, right? So every single measurement is basically a point coordinate. Or we could carefully design it in some CAD application. Now, all these things give us some, something different because for instance, the second one here 
cannot be really explained by a single depth image, right? Or the point cloud, or the third one, or, or the fourth one also, right? Uh, so you cannot really store one image uh, for that. Or, you know, or sometimes the point clouds cannot be meshed, or it's, it's just a very long process to mesh them. And so how do we find a unifying solution to this? So my argument uh, in general to this is let's use point clouds because it's the most generic thing you can do and therefore we can process any 3D data with that method, or with that representation. What's a point cloud? It's basically a matrix or let's say it's a, for now it's a matrix um, where every row stores the attributes of a point. And the point by, I mean, is just X, Y, Z coordinate, so that's maybe an essential attribute, doesn't have to be. And oh. okay, if, apparently I, I, I had the right to admit people, so it's good to know. Um, so a, a point is just, you know, X, Y, Z coordinates plus the, for instance, any other attribute that, that I would like to attach. It could be a surface normal, it could be RGB colors, it could be um, time, whatever, right? So that's, uh, that's just the, you know, the point is, it, it might be in higher dimension space, it doesn't have to live in 3D, but it should contain certain 3D information to explain the object activities. That's a great representation, right? It's just a simple matrix. Now we can do many, many things with that, but unfortunately, it comes with a lot of other, other issues. So first of all, it's an unstructured geometry. So there is no way to grid it. So you know, how can we convolve? How can we do convolutions on that? So it's an open question. Um, another thing is it's a, I will explain a little more about this, but, but maybe I said a couple of words indicating that. So there, you cannot really take that object or scene and fold it on a single plane. This might be impossible. Okay, so we might need multiple planes to fold that object onto. So there's a permutation, well, independence. Um, and and if, if we have mathematicians here, they would know it as, a, so there's a caution thing under the action of permutations, which means um, that if I change the order of the points here, the, the output representation doesn't change, right? So the, the, the I'm still explaining the same bunny object, even if the points are perturbed uh, or, or the order of the points are perturbed, right? So we have to handle that actually. So we have to have functions which are in the permutation independent, right? So this, and this is arguably the most important um, difficulty of working with point clouds. They are sparse. So only the, only really they are super efficient in that, in that sense. Only what is necessary is represented and nothing else. Of course, you can argue that the density of points includes some, uh, maybe some unnecessary information, right? And then that, that's generally very hard to tune which, which density is to store, but that's maybe a hyperparameter of, of that, right? Um, yet the density varies from, from one part of the object to the other. Okay. So it looks like that, right? Uh, on the right, you see an image of an office in Munich. And on the left, there's a point cloud captured by Tango. So they, they explain things fairly well, right? Okay, so I have to speak of that and uh, I have to introduce this notion because we will be making use of that. Generally, when we shoot images, when we shoot 3D data from the world, we cannot see through the object. Right, and therefore the inside of the object is not filled, even if it's usually filled, right? And therefore there is always an underlying lower dimensional subspace that we are interested in. So we are capturing these usually, or, or, or also by our approximations are, are those smoothly varying surfaces, right? And what, and Riemann in, in the 19th century has, has established a nice theory of that uh, the Riemann in geometry, and of course, you know, there are there are other types of geometries, but but you know, it's, his is very relevant here, and uh, I will be explaining this manifold notion from a topological perspective a little bit. So, assume that there is a there is a surface X, right, and that there is a local region U U alpha 
it, it anchored around a certain point, for instance, right? So it's, it's really local. So we can actually define these local coordinate frames, even though this, this is a non-Euclidean surface, right? It's a curved surface. We could still locally warp it back to a Euclidean space. And this is what, what's called a manifold. It's, it's locally Euclidean. And we call this, this map, this, this phi, uh, psi, uh, the local coordinates, right? And we can do it for a, for a U beta, for another other local patch. So there are multiple local coordinates. So you can actually, we can actually cover the object with these, with, with these charts, right? So, right. And, uh, and, the, and if you cover the entirety of that X, then it's called an atlas. So, so we have these uh, set of charts with, with these domains U, right? With this defining the atlas. And of course, to move from alpha to beta, we can do this in the local coordinates as well. We can just uh, map them by, by some by some transition maps, well, basically, right in their in their own coordinate frames. So these are just coordinate transformations. So sometimes they are linear, even, and uh, and we call this manifold smooth if it's infinitely differentiable. And the inverse of that uh, of that map of of the side um, of the chart, right? You see here the second one is called the parameterization. Okay, so these are some some technicalities. Um, from geometry, and uh, maybe just just keep in mind that generally surfaces that we are dealing with are assumed to be such such smooth um, smooth manifolds, even though they are not. Right? This still is a good approximation most of the time. Okay, so back to the question: How can we make neural networks for point clouds? Right, so we we have we have great um, you know advances in in, in these machineries, CNNs. And how can we transfer them to, to point sets now? Well, I said that the most important aspect is permutation invariance, right? And um, how do we capture permutation invariance? Well, we need a function that is independent to the choice of the order. And these functions are called symmetric functions. For instance, I give you a bunch of numbers, right? And uh, from one, three, five, seven, whatever, and I, I and I ask you to to pick the maximum one, regardless of the order, you will always be picking the correct maximum, right? Or if you just add numbers, right? Regardless of the order, the summation will not change. So what other functions exist, right? Maybe, so obviously, um, you know, um, well, not every function is is, is symmetric. But what other functions that we couldn't imagine right now would exist? Right? How can we construct a universal family of such functions? Of course, we will be going to the to the neural networks to do that, right? So we, we have these point coordinates, right? And I'm looking for this for this g function that is kind of independent uh, to the permutations, right? So I can always take max. But what can I? What, what more I can do? So this is one choice. This is just one 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 easy choice, right? Um, well, thanks to the neural networks, what I can do is to lift those points into a high dimension space, right? So it doesn't have to be just three coordinates, it could be anything. Um, so I can do the max there. This is already telling me something important, right? That uh, regardless of the choice of the operator, I can do this in a, in a different space. And maybe the solution, is maybe, maybe there is a better solution to the problem. And then I can concatenate for some activations, for instance, just like the neural networks would do to get to the output. Well, um, obviously you see that if G is symmetric, such a thing is, is symmetric. So it's permutation invariant. Now that little box here is called point net. And, uh, and, and it is true that it approximates a, a lot of the the the, the symmetric a good family of, of of symmetric functions right in fact any symmetric polynomial um, can be expressed as a polynom polynomial sums of the form and and therefore can be explained uh, by that architecture okay so that's uh, that's that's quite good already so what can be constructed well there's a there's a universal approximation theorem to point that 
it basically says that, uh, well, I'm not going to go to the technical details unless you ask. Um, so it, it's just saying that um, there, there's, it can be any, well, any house of court you said, but admit that it's a, it's a you know, a point cloud basically, um, can, be exp uh, can be arbitrarily approximated by point cloud. Right? So that's, that's a great sign. And how can we do the network now? How can we put everything together? Well, um, it's just we will be layering those things, right? It's in, like in a, in, a, in a deep architecture. So we have to first have this input, which is n by three, right? Just ignore the input transform now. I will I will explain what what, what it means later. And we have this our we have our symmetric function in the end. And all the things you see in the middle is basically lifting it to a higher dimension space, right? So we go from n by three to n by one to one thousand two and four. Good. So of course we have to supervise this. Now we, we, we have certain certain global feature there, but we really need strong supervision tools to train this network. So segmentation is one nice uh, task to do that, for instance. And we see certain transformer modules here. Well, the point cloud is composed of two things actually. Well, maybe the images also, right? So there is the appearance of, of, of the image of the point cloud, right? It's 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 a bunny. Bunny is a bunny, right? And then there is the transformation. There is the there is this there is there are those uh, pause variations, for instance, or maybe lighting variations even. But let's focus on the pause. Right? So I can transform the point cloud in in you know with any rotation matrix, for instance, and and the meaning stays the same. And therefore, uh, for for a correct understanding. Uh, we have to get rid of this this rotation, right? And this spatial transformers actually do that exactly. Um, good. So this is our first architecture to process point clouds. Okay. Right. And and yes, yes. In some somewhat in a permutation, it's in a permutation invariant manner, and softly in a transformation invariant manner because it's not completely invariant. Okay, and we see that this, as predicted, performs as at least as good as the, you know, state-of-the-art networks that, that were there um, when this is made. But it is much much faster, and well, it saves you know much more memory, so we can process more things. Now. Good. There are two key aspects that we lack. First of all, we lack locality. So now everything is global, right? The points, we have been thinking about points individually, and we have been lifting them to a high dimension space. Oh, Tolga, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so in your previous slide, like yes. you go back to, yeah, I mean, like when you make this comparison for multi-view, I don't know what you mean by volumetric, but I might be missing that. So volumetric is when we voxelize the point cloud. Okay, voxelization. So how about like feature base? Concepts where they where do they fit in here like feature based registration? And... Ah, so these are just neural networks on on point sets, right? So the feature based things will come in a short while, uh -huh. uh, but these are just architectures that can consume point cloud or three D information. So if we have a point cloud, we we can voxelize it and feed it into a three D convolutional neural network, or or if we have like a mesh kind of three D model. We can capture its capture multiple images from multiple sides synthetically, right? And then feed them to a typical CNN, and then somehow merge them on the output. So we can do all these all these things, right? Uh, these are different representations, if you want. I, I did not here put the deep SDF family, but there are also SDFs, for instance, sign distant fields. Um, so you know, this is really just just operating neural networks on point clouds. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Cool. So what is lacking here is locality, which is very important. Uh, by the way, is, uh, is there any other question? Okay. So there, there, is, there is, so we, we solved a lot of, a lot of problems. Uh, we solved permutation invariance, translation invariance, of course, and we have a hierarchical mechanism to do learning, you know, and so on. It's, it's powerful. But the locality notion is definitely missing here, which is, which is quite important, right? In, in images, if you think of CNNs, 
there is this receptive field that is that is shrinking gradually and it's becoming more local maybe in the in the initial layers and then uh, going more global in the deep layers right we don't have this notion now okay then how do we do the, the hierarchical learning in in, in local uh, local groups well we basically take a point a query a neighborhood around it right it's uh, just take the points in the vicinity basically and create a coordinate frame new coordinate frame which is uh, anchored uh, on the point of reference here and then we apply a point net basically this is a good idea right um, but i cannot just apply it once and and and, and then not learn anything from that um, i i should be first of all taking different points right and with each point after each point net I, let me go back here um, there's a there's a higher dimensional feature vector that we have right so now we are actually transforming each local region into a region that is, of course, composed of the point coordinates, but also of the high dimensional features that we extracted. Mm, and we go like that, right? And we have this kind of uh, downsampling of the object, but every downsampled point is actually summarizing a local neighborhood. We can do this to over the entire. Uh, architecture right so we can sample group apply point net sample group apply point net iteratively and these are called set abstraction layers and we can do we can do different tasks now such as segmentation and classification in whatnot so we, we have to do some kind of an up convolution of course for the segmentation but maybe we can do this uh, with simple things right so some some interpolation plus point nets and so on like classical MLP things for decoding There are many, many works, many other things uh, like DGCNNs, there's the EdgeConf and then KPConf, Shellnet and, and, and more Riemannian geometric convolution operators on point clouds. And there's just, a, this is a huge domain. I just gave you the two most important works maybe, right? Um, but this, this notion of locality is, is, is important uh, to, to keep in mind. We will, we will get back to that, but before this, uh, I will also touch upon the generation a little bit. So we have this encoding, right? So we have the point encoding now, which we have a segmentation layer or, or classification layer. We can extract some latent features, mm, but what can we do with that is, is of course generation, right? So how can we use this latent feature in, in, in a generative process? One way to, to, to do that is model D by also by MLPs and hope that you can actually take that latent feature and, and extract the point cloud out of that. It's great, but it, this is really, you can do it in, in every domain with, with everything, right? It's not really using 3D information as we do in the beginning. Olga, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, what does this assume about your input cloud points uh, or volumetric representation? Uh, does it assume, for example, that you have a very precise measurement of uh, the points in the 3D space as you would have in the case of a LIDAR to start with, or does it, uh, assume that you have no information about the 3D structure and you're over time collecting 3D information and building that 3D uh, oh, I see. volumetric information to start with. Because I can imagine you mean different in, kinds of representations being useful in, in the two cases. They're quite distinct cases, I think. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's very true. Um, you mean for the decoder or are you asking also for the... Also the encoder as well, because, you know, if I... I'm sure that I know the uh, positions of these points in 3D quite well, then maybe a different kind of representation, a different kind of encoding becomes feasible compared to the case where I'm building evidence to construct my 3D appearance at the same time as well. So the good part of point cloud is of course that, that you, can, you can explain any object up to any resolution as much as the machine allows right right so, not necessarily the, the representation itself but the encoding too like right, uh, right. i can yeah. imagine maybe a different kind of encoding strategy being more feasible if you uh, have assumptions on your uh, 3d cloud say yeah, say true. it's precise a precise 3d mm -hmm. cloud or a a noisy or one that you don't know anything about at all okay yes that's true so 
it's it, it's it's a it's a very good point. So if you know if you know additional things that you can you can devise better decoders maybe for sure. Um, but what I want to say here, um, or what I wanted to maybe say a little bit at this point, is that uh, point clouds are generic, right? Regardless that the data is, even if you have a voxel grid, you can still convert it to a point cloud just by taking the voxel centers. Right? Well, my and, question was more about the eventual application. Uh, so your eventual application could be, as, say, an autonomous driver uh, machinery, which tries to build 3D model of the world as it drives along. Or it could be a model that knows the environment, the 3D environment that it's within, but maybe it's trying to localize the camera position. So in yeah. one case, the world uh, objects and their positions are well known. In the other one, they are being constructed as we go. I see. Yes, yes. Um, sure, I, I agree. So you, I, I think PointNet is not allowing both applications in its vanilla form, um, but it's a backbone for, for doing that. I will come to localization in a while, for instance. Um, it, can, it can be a backbone for doing that, or it can also be like a backbone for aggregating points over time. Right, so maybe we don't want to aggregate points in, in 3D space because it's too costly. Then we can be aggregating things in a latent space, which we can later decode on demand, right? Something like that. Can um, I add something, Tolga? I mm -hmm. think if there is noise in your point cloud that you are trying to reconstruct with an autoencoder, it will not be possible to learn it because it will be random irregularities in your data, right? I don't think autoencoder will pick that up. I haven't seen any examples of noisy point clouds being autoencoded, but that would be my guess. Um, you see what I mean? I think that is the question Metinoja is asking. What happens if there is noise in your point cloud? I think you can still encode it. Of course, in decoding, I think you can encode it. I, I don't see why. We have done it. Um, I, I mean, the noise will be ignored by the autoencoder. That's what you mean, right? You can still autoencode the object. Yeah, probably. Okay. I mean, ho hopefully. <laughs> I don't think deep learning ignores noise. Deep learning is actually, on the contrary, it anchors to the noise. So it will just ignore the, the, the randomness that it sees in the data. But it will it will stick onto any other uh, any other noise for the sake of overfitting. If it is regular, if it is observed it is somehow, again and again, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. If there is a bias, it will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> but the decoding, I think, we won't be able to decode at least um, noisy point clouds. This, I highly. I think it, it won't happen much. As we can we can consume noisy point clouds, but I don't know if you can really generate very noisy point clouds. I will I will come to that and I will explain why I don't think that. At least at least with, with methods that I will be presenting to you. So maybe just an MLP using a simple MLP might even be better for generating noisy stuff because it can overfit better. Okay, so you can do that. Okay, so this this generation. So first of all, just like in an autoencoder, we need to measure some some form of a discrepancy with respect to the input. That means that we have to measure the discrepancy of two point clouds, which is not immediate because we don't know the correspondence. At least sometimes we don't know, and when we don't know the correspondence. There's like an iterative closest point type of uh, distance, which is called the chamfer distance. And it's it's a funny story why this is actually called chamfer distance because it's completely unrelated, I think, but people call that. Um, so this is just assigning each point to its closest neighbor in the, in the other point cloud and summing up the distances. And it's doing it in a, in a bi-directional way. Um, so it's symmetric. The other part is we can compute actually the optimal transport between two point clouds and take the optimal transport distance. Right? 
this is well more principled maybe and it actually yields better results but it's a little costly to compute there are other types of distances and there is a paper on this and so on but these are the most uh, used ones okay so i told you that the, the object the objects we are interested in, at least are kind of coming from this underlying uh, submanifold right of a Euclidean space so what that means is we can take a sheet of paper and fold it to create different objects right? so i can i can actually wrap a paper around my i don't know around my bottle here to reconstruct the shape of the bottle right? and this is what folding net tries to do it learns to fold one napkin onto almost any shape and because it's just one napkin uh, we can only reconstruct shapes that are isomorphic to sphere for instance so what it does, it takes the latent code that is encoded, that is coming from the encoder, and attaching a grid, a, a coordinate, a really x y coordinate, next to that latent code. So each coordinate is concatenated this this latent code, so it's replicated. And then we have two neural networks, so or two two MLPs that would take this you know, concatenated matrix and deforms it basically to the to the output shape and these are just MLPs. and the number of points in the output is equal to the number of points in the grid here so there is a one-to-one -one correspondence from the object to the grid which is a nice thing okay and um, here is a drawing from from the paper but basically there's a, there's a graph based encoder in their paper but please think that this is a point net that's really simply a point net here and there's a code word, of course, that we have. This is the latent code. And we replicate the latent code m times to these grid points and just have those folding layers or MLPs that will generate the output. And to, to self-supervise this, we can use a chamfer distance. Right. Okay, so there are some nice visualizations of that if that plays. Interestingly. Okay, maybe later. So I mean, I, it was just showing some 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 points emerging from a sphere, for instance, or a random initialization, or a morphing between two point sets. We can do that because we know the correspondence thanks thanks to the existence of the grid. Right now. And I also told you that one planar patch is not enough to cover the entire object. So we need these multiple planar patches. And this is what AtlasNet exactly does. Instead of attaching one grid, it att attaches multiple grids to the latent code, each of which is specific to a local region. And then it deforms it using multiple MLPs again to reconstruct the output shape. Then how do you repeat them, Tolga? Like you were repeating multi-code uh, work vectors which one do you repeat or do you repeat them equally um so you repeat this one single latent code to oh, okay, all all the grid grid points here and then different to the mlps in in folding net that that you just actually have one mlp followed by another mlp that is processing the entirety of that concatenated patch um here we have something different for each grid that we have here, we have a different MLP. So instead of a sequential concatenation of MLPs, we have this vertical arrangement. And uh, that that works better because each MLP can, can then specialize to a local region transforming one grid there. Do they show that this is actually what happens? Like which MLP they is specialized? Do. They actually do. And in fact, right. there is no supervision of that. So there is no, this is, this is this is completely an emergent behavior. And how they explain it is, is because the, well, because the neural networks always take the shortcut. Right? They want to spend the minimum effort to optimize that energy. And the minimum effort dictates that you cannot really spread one patch over the entire object. The patch has to stay local. But because of chamfer distance, you have to cover the entire object, otherwise the loss is not minimized. 
So it's just moving these different patches to different parts of the object itself. I see. I see. Which is surprising. I think this will also not play them. Yes. Okay, I can I can show you this later. Well, let's let's take a look at look, at, look a closer look to this decoding business. So we have this point set point net here, right? So we have, we can take the latent code, as I said, we can apply certain MLPs on it to go to the object. This is completely unconstrained, and we hope that by the chamfer distance it can generate great things, but it doesn't usually. So this is a very vanilla thing to do. And then there is the folding net, right? It takes the, the, the feature vector f, replicates it, and then concatenates, uh, concatenates it to each grid point, and then has two MLPs. And then Atlas net does the same. What we have here in Atlas net is a different grid, but it's still the same latent code. So the latent code is not explaining the local geometry. It's just giving the global context. And the entire local notion is captured in those MLPs that come after. We can do a little better than that. We can actually do take, you know, have multiple latent codes. So many, many latent codes and then many, many grids. Right? And this is this is forcing this way, it's more controllable, right? Because I know that one local region is captured by one precise latent vector. So this is what we did in this point capsule networks in 3D. And there's a, um, a easy architecture for that. So here is here's what happens. We take the input shape. We encode it, right? It's the latent feature. So now we can decode it. This is the typical thing to do. But now instead we have um, multiple latent codes, which are which I refer as latent capsules. Okay. And each of them can be related to, to a local part of that object. And the architecture is, is, is also simple. I mean, how, how do I generate multiple latent vectors? I think this is an interesting question. Well, instead of just doing one convolutional kind of point, well, one, one dimensional convolutional point net, we can do multiple of those, right? And initialize just initialize them by ran, ran, initialize them randomly and hope that in the end it will learn something meaningful, something local. And this is the encoder. This is just the encoder, it's multiple point nets. And then forming this huge primary point capsules, which is which is a you know higher dimensional parameterization of the latent space, if you want. And then on the output, we have of course a more structured latent space, which has enough info, you know, enough enough dimensions as we want. And we can concatenate this to the grid and blah blah and do this MLPs like Atlas Net and get to the output. Um, of course, we have to go from these primary point capsules to latent capsules, and this is the well, okay, there's a chamfer loss, and this is the dynamic routing that, that is made famous by the, by the capsule networks. And it's just a clustering algorithm, by the way. So we cluster these primary point capsules into latent capsules. Okay, so this is, for instance, an encoder decoder architecture that, is, uh, that, can, that can do local things as well as, uh, as, well as global things. Tolga, I have a question. Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea, by the way, congrats. Are these latent capsules related to each other in any way other than the shared encoder in the beginning? Um, yeah, I mean, they are. So How? I think they are because, so they are related as follows. The, the, there's also, so there's a local, there's no local loss. It's just a chance loss. There's one loss. Which there is, is one loss. All of them. Which is, all, which, is, which is combining all of them. But architecturally, for example, something like graph neural network, whatever. Architecturally, the there is also an information leakage because that's a soft algorithm. So this is like a soft k-means. Really think of it like a soft k-means. These are the cluster centroids. And these are what I'm trying to cluster. Okay. I and see. because it's not a hard k-means, it's not really, um, it's not really taking all the, just you know all the things that are assigned to to that to that thing, right? It's it's soft in the sense that there is a probabilistic assignment, so there is a small probability that other things can leak into that. Weighted sum of weighted sum of all the primary point capsules. Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a weighted sum, and you hope that the weights are very steep, but that, that that's a trade-off, right? The, the the sharper like direct data like the weights. The, the more numerically inaccurate you are, the softer the weights, the, the better the accuracy. So 
you know, I don't know which part the neural network stops. Uh, actually, I didn't. Do. Thanks. Cool. So as I said, we can do part-based oper operations with it, like part-based morphing, part-based generation, and so on. But now we want to go even more local. So how can we go, you know, how can we do that? So we essentially want to make the sift of the point clouds. This has been a study from, you know, that the geometric people also studied that. How can we do that, right? So if, because if, I, if we can do that, then for instance, we can go from object level processing to the scene level processing, right? Because now I can ch just take local chunks of the scene and then somehow relate them, for instance, with a ransack like algorithm. If you want. And um, yeah, this is this is hard to do on point clouds, by the way. So because in an image, a plain wall, we don't extract features on, and this is fine maybe. But if I if, if in 3D I'm not extracting features on planar regions, then it's basically most of the geometry is just gone. And I cannot use that global context. So and, and in fact, we have been examining this a little bit. Uh, there are only four or five type of local geometries in 3D space, if, if my neighborhood size is not large. Okay, so it's a difficult problem. It is, it's not the same. So what we want to do, we want to take multiple patches, just like we will do right, in a, in a ransack-like image scenario. And then we will kind of describe each patch which with, with its own, you know, I don't know. So it could be, it, 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 this patch description could be as simple as a, local coordinate transformation or uh, alignment to the local reference frame, or it could be something more sophisticated like transforming points to a representation that is rotation invariant, which is desired. And we can, for instance, take all these patches now and use point net like architectures to encode each and every single one. And this patch description here, we use these point pair features, which is basically Okay, let me show it like this. So there's a red point, which is the center of the patch. And then there are black points. These are the points in the patch. And at each point, I assume the availability of a surface normal, which is N here, and also for the other ones at each point here. And then I pair that central point with every single black point here, okay? And for each pair, I compute this phi, this like four dimensional descriptor, which is the distance between the red point and the black point. And then the angle between the, the difference vector and the surface normal. So this, this, this vector, for instance, and the normal, and then vice versa, this vector and the normal of this point cloud or this point, sorry. And then the, the, the difference, the angular difference between the two normals. And of course, it's easy to verify that this is invariant to the rotations. So we can use this representation to encode the entire patch. So it lifts the point cloud from n times four um, dimensionality to or size to, so m, m, <clears throat> sorry, from m, n times three to n times four, because it's four dimensional. Now we can do something interesting because so normally when, when we were doing point net, we could process the entire point cloud at once. And this is desirable because the networks is global context. But if I go completely local now, I will lose the entire global context. So how can I do a sweet spot? How can I do both local and, 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 and some in global? So I can do this. Um, I can extract each patch with, with, with extract the descriptors of, of each patch with a point net, right? So this is, this is still the point pair feature representation, by the way. And then I can max pool over all the features to get a global code, right? So it's basically saying that a, a, a local feature of a table, of the, of the corner of a table in the living room should not be represented with the same code as a, as a, as a table in, a, of, in an office, right? In an office-like environment. So these are different things. Where table is situated, matters for the for the code itself All right so i can i can concatenate that global feature now back to the local feature so it's like a semi global feature now and use some mlp to get the final local features and we can interestingly train this with something contrastive 
which is, you know, the contrastive losses probably. So whatever should belong together must belong together and, uh, and vice versa. So, but we have to do this holistically now because we want to process all the patches at once, right? So we, th that's why we process the, we propose this n-tuple loss, which is basically trying to make the Euclidean space distance matrix, right? So, so the, the transform one point set onto the other one and measure the discrepancy in the Euclidean space. That distance should be the same as the distance in the feature space per point or per point pair distance in the feature space. And so if we enforce this, then this is like a holistic contrastive loss. That's why we call it n loss. And it, it performs, performs uh, quite well. But this is, first of all, supervised, right? And it's, we also use the point coordinates here, even if I don't tell you. Um, how can we get rid of the two things? Well, we can get rid of it by an autoencoder, of course, because this is the way to go unsupervised. So just take the point set and, and encode it into this 4D point pair feature representation and then applying a folding net. So this is now not a three-dimensional folding net, but a four-dimensional folding net. Okay, good. So these are just local descriptors of a, of a patch, of a point patch. We can do something more interesting now. So I told you that the point cloud is composed of two things, appearance and pulse, right? A simple point cloud, because we don't capture lighting variations, for instance, in point sets, at least for, with LiDAR scans or so. So how can, how can I disentangle the two? Well, I can, I can do one encoding with a rotation invariant input representation and then an encoding with a rotation variant one. And hopefully the difference between these two encodings will give me a code that is related only to the pose of the object. So this is structure plus appearance minus, uh, sorry, structure plus pose minus structure equals pose kind of thing, okay? And if I have a, just a pose related descriptor, right? Then I can use two pose related descriptors to compute the object pose, for instance, from that, which is easy. I can just concatenate these and give it to an MFP, right? Um, so we have done this line of work. Basically, we applied these, these feature descriptors to all sorts of places. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, meant, I forgot to mention this. Um, that it, it, So if I can now compute a tra local transformation for each patch, Right, so, so for each point pair, because we can also match points now because we have their descriptors, right? We can easily match them. And for each match, as I show you here, we can assign a transformation. And then we can go ahead and verify that, that whether these transformations are able to register the scenes globally. And we can see, we can, we can take the best one like in a ransack fashion. Not even, this is not an, even a ransack though, just we take the best transformation that aligns two scenes. So the local transformation should also be the transformation of the global scene. This is the idea. Okay, so as I said, we, we, we did this line of work. So from, you have now seen all of these four works that are, that are shown in a box here. Um, so we, we did these works and they, they were really performing quite well and, and progressed on the, on the handcrafted descriptors, which are spin images, shots and stuff. Um, and you see that they are situated here. And after that came Perfect Match and FCGF. They are quite powerful descriptors. I really like them, especially FCGF. Um, and, and they push the frontier and especially, especially FCGF is also very, very efficient. So, but, but now what we can do is, is just take these 3D scenes, for instance, a collection of them and compute, you know, the, the, the matching between all of them, right? And then register them into a global scene, like a, you know, like we like what we would do in like a sift light stitching scenario, but in three D. Right. Um, so we can, yeah. Th these descriptors, by the way, were evaluated in in feature matching. We can also evaluate them in geometric registration. And this this fault here, this LR, is latent ransack, which is which is one of the most efficient things around ours is both more efficient and, and is higher in recall, at least. 
Okay, and you can see different things that are just automatically registered. And the global fusion algorithm going from, from you know, pairwise, pairwise poses to a global registration uh, is, is a very simple one. It's just a very greedy heuristic. So we are not using any synchronization like algorithm to do that. So these are some issues. Okay, good. But this just is 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 the you know surface of the problem because real life doesn't appear like that, right? How it appears is we have all these repetitive structures, identical objects, you know, uh, that, that, that stuff that we cannot distinguish, and so on. So there's a there's a concept called VUCA. It, it comes from economics. So life is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And uh, this is used a lot in, in stock market uh, uh, predictions and so on, right? Uh, and, and we have to apply, I think, some, some concepts to computer vision here as well. But the, the problem here is what is ambiguity and what is uncertainty, right? And to me, so I, I will just give the definitions according to myself. It's, it's, it's very subjective because there are many, many definitions existing for these things. Um, I, I see ambiguity as anything that can be interpreted more than one way. Okay, so you see here on the left, that it's, it's either a bunny or the bird. On the right is a famous image, by the way, I'm, I'm really horrible for not citing it, um, that there are, I think, more than seven um, little details that, that, that you can see. So. The obvious ones are, are the hand and the pig, but you can see in the man as well that there are many, many, you know, an old man, a, a lady, and so on. Right, so, you know, there is, this is one definition of ambiguity from the, from the perspective of visual illusions. Um, and what is uncertainty is, is kind of our room for making mistakes. Right? So it's, 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 it's the amount of confusion we know. It's basically, let's say you are driving on this road, you look at the road, you think that you are going with 80 kilometers per hour, and you think that you are, you are safe in the radar limit. But then you look at the you know, speedometer and it tells you that you are going with almost with 120 because the car is super nice, uh, so you don't feel it. Right? And this, the uncertainty is, is here, you know, maybe maybe, so you have this margin of 40 kilometers per hour uh, mistake. There's probably you have some kind of a standard deviation there when predicting the speed. Okay, so we want to assign some, some level of confidence to our predictions. Right, and, um, and there's a huge literature on that. It's coming from Greek, Greek, ancient Greek literature, actually, and I like it. So one form of uncertainty is epistemic uncertainty. So it's the uncertainty contained in our knowledge, in our model, right? So we have these um, basically bad models that cannot really explain the real world phenomena. And of course, the model has a certain, you know, capacity to explain things. And epistemic uncertainty is exactly this uncertainty in the model, right? So for instance, uh, it, but, but, but it can be cured, especially in the, in, the, in the era of machine learning. If I give you more and more data for the edge cases, in the distribution, then you would probably be, your model would probably be better if it's data driven, right? So it can be explained away with more data a little bit. Then there's the aleatoric um, uncertainty, which is the uncertainty of the dice player. Um, and basically it's, it's the stochastic type of uncertainty, right? It's, it's coming in the data. For instance, if you have a camera, especially a 3D camera and capture the scene two times, you never get the same points. So there is a type of uncertainty in this, in this data, right? Um, so there's an information that we cannot capture from the scene physically. And this goes, this gets divided into two. One is the homoscedastic and the other is heterostadistic, scedastic. And uh, one is uncertainty is the same for all inputs. So it is the same characteristic like sensor noise, dependent on the sensor and not on the scene itself, maybe. Well, it might be dependent, but you know, if the say, scene is composed of the same element, then the noise, the, the sensor will just impose the same level of noise characteristics on it. 
And on the other hand, there's the there's the input that can vary. There's the, there's the uncertainty that can vary with the input, right? There's a, maybe there's a featureless wall. There is you know there's some 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 kind of a real life phenomena that that that's hard to capture and so on. And I'm positioning ambiguity in that type of a uncertainty, right? Of course, ambiguities are leading to uncertainties in life. Um, and I think this this is the type of uncertainty that that it, that it's going again subjective everything. Okay, so usually we model these two things together. There are models that spread the two, but when we report uncertainties, there is a little bit of epistemic things leaking into our predictions. So in the end, we are giving one number for uncertainty. Okay. So here is what I, how I see uh, this, this ambiguity and uncertainty business. Okay, so when, when, when there is no ambiguity, right? So you see that chair or you see that room. So chair is a 3D object, room is a 2D scene, right? And you know maybe immediately where the camera is or what the object pose is, okay? And so th there is no repeated, repeating structures and there is no sensor noise or, you know, th things are perfect maybe. And you can you can figure things out. And 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 if you would like to report the if you don't want to report the uncertainty, right? What we can report for these things is just the pause of the object or pause of the camera. Now, if you want to report uncertainty, what we should say is here is the pause of the object, plus here is how I characterize my confidence. Here is a confidence measure for you. Now, if, we, if the scene contains ambiguities, that means, you know, maybe I have this little image of the chair and the same chair appears six times in that image, right? Or I have a, 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 a 3D shape that is perfectly symmetric. So it's almost impossible to explain the pose of that object with a single solution, right? What we can do, we can report multiple solutions. So we can say that, okay, the, the, the pose of the chair can be here, 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 and here. Right? And in the case of no uncertainty, these are just a collection of modes. Right? These are just a collection of direct delta functions, if you want. And you know, this is what you want to capture. Plus, if you would like to say something about the uncertainty, then uh, you know, we are probably resorting to reporting the variance of a certain distribution. And at each one, we should be giving a confidence measure. We, we should be giving a standard deviation or entropy or whatever, right? Um, so so there, there are these two types of information that is needed. And this is why I, I distinguish between uncertainties and ambiguities, right? One is capturing different modes. The other is really saying for each mode, how certain we are. And this comes for the multimodality. Right, and, uh, and here you see on the left, you see a distribution. There are two modes. And if you do the standard neural network thing to predict the pulse, you will get the conditional average, which is that purple peak, which that, that it's, you know, it's, it's actually a bad mode that you are reporting. Um, so we have to capture multiple modes, right? So we can do multimodal predictions maybe and, uh, and, and, and capture these modes. Um, or if you want to report uncertainties, we will like to capture the entirety of the, of the posterior. Or you know, if it's not the entire, then, then we should say something at least about you know, how the posterior distribution behaves around these two modes. Right? This is the, and then it would come, the, the question would come, how can I fit continuous multimodal distributions to posteriors, which is interesting. Of course, there's a huge machine learning community working on that, but you know, they don't have 3D problems. So this is what I will be focusing on. Okay, and here you see that there are multiple modes, for instance. And so this is a result of, our, of, a, of a network prediction, maybe. And there are, there are certain places where things are confident. So when, when you know, I don't know, when, 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 when cameras are shooting from here, maybe. And there are places where it's less confident here and here. So it's the uncertainty colored here, right? So this is this is type of, you know, these are type of things that we want to say. Okay, so at some point I should tell you what a pose is, for me at least. 
Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a. Generally, we work with linear trans, linear representation of this, um, of 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 the transformations of three D things. And it's basically composed of a rotation matrix belonging to a special orthogonal group and a translation vector, which is a Euclidean element. And the point in 3D X transforms rigidly as Rx plus T to another point in, in 3D space. And this is called a rigid transformation. And in short, we say that it's the pose. Well, it's not the human pose. It's the rigid pose here. So, um, and we, we generally like to speak of these quaternions. Uh, here a question. So who knows what a quaternion is? Uh, well, uh, at least anyone who, who wouldn't know, just shout it out so I can explain it. Okay, so everyone knows, great. Well, they are just different representations of rotations. So, so great. So their action on the point is, is a little different. And uh, their constraint is, is, is being on the sphere instead of being living in the special orthogonal group. Right? The translations are just the same. Cool. So here there's an added challenge. The, you, you, you see, we, I have spoken to you about distributions here, right? And there's a huge machine learning community working on this, yes. But um, the problem is we have geometric parameter spaces. So I don't want distributions in Euclidean space. I want distributions on rotation. So it's, it's distributions on manifolds, right? So how, how do we do this? So there's another area of defining distributions, uh, which is the Riemannian deep learning, Riemannian Bayesian deep learning. So there are many, many methods there. There are a lot of major theoretic definitions of distributions and so on, which is okay, which is great. You know, but sometimes you know they they can be an overkill uh, because I have to define everything in the local local tangent space, and then I have to just re-architect the entire neural network to to do that. It's it's a cool it's a cool thing to do, but you know maybe not the best sometimes. The other approach is just define your distribution. Maybe maybe your parameter space is simple enough that you can find a distribution for it. Right? So just on the parameter space. So notice we don't want to define, so not, so in a Bayesian deep learning scenario, each of the weights in, in the network would be associated a certain uncertainty. And if it's a Riemannian machinery, that means that each weight is living on a Riemannian manifold. So maybe your entire neural network is composed of rotational convolution units, right? With a standard deviation that each one has. You see how complicated this gets already. Now we, we would like to avoid this a little bit. Um, so I, I, I want to go to a different direction and, and, and take this path because for rotations, there is, so for, for, for translations, I can define a Euclidean distribution, right? That's not so hard because there is just three elements and maybe it's descriptive enough. And for rotations, there is the Bingham distribution, which is a, you know, a, a distribution on the sphere, an antipodally symmetric one. So quaternions are also antipodally symmetric, by the way. And I wish I could have written here, but but look at it this way. So if V gamma, uh, sorry, V, v lambda V transpose, if that was, if, the, if, if that were a, a, a sigma, right? Or a sigma inverse, that would be a Gaussian distribution. You see that. Now what we do here is we kind of, do the write the eigen decomposition of the of the const, of the covariance of the Gaussian. That means that locally at that point, if if v is also a function of x, right? If v is also a function of x, then locally at x, that means I'm I'm doing the eigen decomposition, which means I'm I'm kind of computing the principal directions, as shown on the right. And along each direction here, I am defining the, 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 the deviation or the variance using the concentration parameters here, said lambda. And of course I have three axes here now and the ordering of the axes should depend on the ordering of the lambda or vice versa. So ordering of lambda should de depend on ordering of axes. And therefore uh, I, have, I have complete freedom in choosing this order. People generally sort that down, sort the eigenvalues, okay? And, uh, and, and the first, first one 
the first axis is the green one. Okay, they usually, this is a common convention. And then what, let's see what that means. This is a unit sphere, right? And on a unit sphere, the coordinate of the points and the components of the normal vector are the same. When you think about it, it's, it's a unit sphere. The normal vector is the same as the coordinates. That means that green points, the, the, so the green arrow, the, 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 the elements of the green arrow are exactly the same as the coordinate of the blue point, uh, purple point. That means uh, that the first, so to, to the first vector in V in this eigen decomposition is also the mode of the distribution, right? Because it's, so this green arrow is the first element in V, if the first X is in V, and the purple point is just the same as this green arrow. So the first element of V is actually the purple point. Okay. And of course we have a complicated normalization factor, which, you know, we will handle somehow. Okay, so this is an antipodal symmetric distribution. So X and minus X because of the squaring represent the same things, you know, just like Q and minus Q represent the same things. Um, therefore, if you take the mean of the distribution, it's always zero all the time. Therefore, we don't speak of the mean, we speak of the mode of the distribution. And this V is, is really an eigen, coming from an eigen decomposition. So it's an orthonormal frame uh, of, of these X's composed of these three X's or three X's here, but, but for quaternions, this is four dimensional. So I'm always visual, visualizing things in three dimensions, but you know, think, of, think that we are in, in one dimension higher. And you know, there are some nice formulas for the covariance and whatnot. Okay, so here comes a question. Um, how can I, so given this, so I, I, I already told you that the, the, the first column of V, that, 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 that uh, eigen decomposition matrix or this orthogonal matrix is the mod, mod of the distribution, right? So, so let's say I, I would like to construct a distribution on a given mod. And the mod, of course, I know that is the first column of V. And the other thing I know is that the other frames, right? The, 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 this, this blue and, and red frames are orthogonal to that axis. So now the question is, and, and I'm in a four dimensional space, right? It's a quaternion. So it's not three by three, it's four by four. How can I compute these other X's which are orthogonal to, to Q in the first column? So that's a question. Given one vector, how can I find three other orthogonal vectors? Three. What comes to my to the mind immediately? So I have one 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 column vector, and and I would like to basically orthogonalize the rest. Any suggestions? Okay, maybe it didn't appear to you immediately, but the answer maybe is that gram schmidt You know, you probably know it from linear algebra already. So it's it's a way of constructing these ortho, ortho, orthonormal vectors, right? Um, but you see this expression. It's a very complicated expression actually, and it's highly nonlinear. And if we if we write such thing in the middle of a neural network, for instance, the network has to differentiate through that. And I have written the derivative my, derivatives myself, uh, actually auto-generated them. Uh, it took about four pages of LaTeX code to write them down. Because you do this four times recursively and each stage depends on the, on the previous one. Okay, so it's, it's complicated and we don't want to write this. Um, what, what else can we do? So it's not the simplest solution, obviously. Well, we could do this Cayley transformation, which is also interesting. So write this skew, skew symmetric matrix and then apply this transformation, you get immediately uh, an orthonormal vector. 
So Q is the mod. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 are the components of Q. And we'll just assemble this skew symmetric matrix and just, just compute this little product here. This is good. It's simpler at least, but there's still an inversion, right? It doesn't look very nice. Um, but at least, um, you know, it can somehow be applied here. So we can do something better, um, which we use this the notion of parallelizability. Here is what that means. Um, if we, so if I ask you that there's a, there's a vector in 2D, x, y, and, and if I tell you, that, give, me the, give me the orthogonal vector to the vector x, y, what would you do? Do you remember that? So a two, there's a 2D vector, and I, and I ask you to find the orthogonal one. Give me the coordinates of the orthogonal one. What would you do? Uh, inner product? Uh, related. Yes, the inner product should be 0 uh, of the 2, I agree. Because they are orthogonal. But how would you say? Like, there's, there's, the, there's the, the vector x, y in 2D space. And I want you to tell me the coordinates of the orthogonal vector that is the, the vector that is orthogonal to x, y. It's quite simple, actually. We all we have all done it in high school. So we would just write the minus y and x, no? It's really just, you know, you flip the two and negate one of them. Negate the first. I think that's what Mugia meant. The inner product? Yeah. How yeah, so the inner product of the two are just zero. I agree. But then how do you get that by just doing what you said, right? I mean, to me, they're the same thing, but OK. <laughs> uh, they might not be the same, right? So there are, there are at least two vectors that are orthogonal, first of all. Oh, that, that might be multiple ways. I see. Yeah, OK. Um, but still, I mean, it's related. The inner product is 0. You, you find something that the inner product is 0. But I mean. In high school, we all we all memorized this, right? It's minus y comma x. At least they made me memorize it. I remember. So this turns out, it turns out that that this is only doable in uh, in dimensions one, two, four, and eight, and that's because that manifold is what they say topologically parallelizing. Okay, so I won't get into the details, but I think it's an interesting thing. And we are because we are in four dimensions, you can exactly do the same trick. So this is really doing x, y, and so, so it's here is, is, is four dimension, four, four numbers, and you do this strange arrangement. And by the way, here there are, I think, 48. Uh, so we had at least two, right? Um, two, two ways to pick. Here there are 48 ways to pick. So that's, you know, grows, the, the curse of dimensionality applies, I think. Okay. Um, so th it's a very simple procedure, right? Uh, it's, it's just there is there is almost no calculation. So this is this is great. I can immediately set that matrix up. Cool. So now uh, let's do some parameter estimation on on Bingham distribution. So what we know is what is this VQ, by the way? So by defining that, I know immediately how to construct a Bingham distribution on a given mode. And this is just like constructing a Gaussian distribution given a mean and variance. But here it was not really obvious. Right. So our input will be images or point clouds, right? So I'm assuming that I have an I have x as input, which is m by n by c, and uh, n is three um, for point clouds, and c, c is one. But uh, for images, m can be the width, and n, n can be the height. Um, this, M can be the height and N can be the width and uh, C can be the channels, right? And then we are trying to find the predict predictor function, right? This mu gamma, which goes from our, this, this input X to a coterminal. And I want to learn the parameters gamma of that neural network. 
or whatever the prediction function, predictive function is, right? And we know now that the V uh, is a function uh, of X on, on the input and Lambda is also a function of the input. Okay. So this is, uh, this is important. And, uh, and, and how I can write this is, maybe this is a little important is that V is, is a function of X, but I have to pass X through mu, right? And then compute that. And similarly for Lambda. Right. Uh, this is why I wrote the parameters here. And, uh, and uh, this is just the, just the Bingham density, by the way, nothing more. And I'm writing it as with, with the shorthand notation here, down. Right, so V mu and lambda gamma and V mu transpose. It, this is just the Bingham distribution on, you know, parameterized by Q. So if I'm given a set of images, set of labels, right? And I want to learn the parameters of it. I of course do this maximum likelihood estimation. Right? So I define my loss function with respect to the input and the labels and then maximize the parameters. This is what we do, but, but we take the logarithm of course, and then we get rid of this uh, normalization constant. However, it depends on the Lambda. So if Lambda is something we want to learn, then we have to consider that in the optimization. Um, and, 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 and we actually want to report the uncertainty, right? So we want to report this lambda or something related to it. So we have to differentiate the root. And there are ways to do that. We never compute it. We, we compute it once and store it and do, just do the nearest neighbor lookup, like interpolate, um, whatever comes. And so we really approximate that, uh, that hypergeometric confluence function there. Okay, um, so this is what we can do. This, this is the, you know, we can maximize that uh, through a neural network and then, uh, and then get, get the desired thing. And this is how it would look. So we have either a point cloud or an image. The point cloud can pass through point net. The image can pass through a standard convolutional neural network, your favorite one. And we regress seven values. Of course, three for translation. Uh, sorry, three for, uh, sorry, there's no translation here. Three for um, concentration parameters and four for the mod. So this is for the distribution, the, the distribution of the mod. And these are for the concentration parameters. So basically the variation along each axis. Okay. And they have to be sorted, right? The axis should correspond. Therefore, we have to include inject a sorting mechanism. And this is what we do through the exponentiation because we know that it's always possible, positive, right? So we just regress these three values and then sort the things kind of. And, um, and this is a unimodal regression. So what we regress in the end is that VQ matrix, which is constructed as I have told you before, and the Lambda matrix, right? And this, these two together define the entire single mod Bingham distribution, Bingham density. And you know, if, if there is one solution to the problem, then it's good we can report uncertainty now. In fact, we can report uncertainty in each of the directions in a coterminal, for instance. And you can do the same with the Gaussian distribution for translations. Okay. Now I told you ambiguity is good with multiple modes, right? So it's basically tracking the, the instances of, you know, Different uh, different objects, for instance, and one way to do that is being a mixture models, right? So this way it's continuous, and we can have some form of an uncertainty characteristic. Plus, we can capture different modes in the so you know because it's a mixture model, right? It's a multi-model distribution. It's good. Um, but training that Bingham mixture models, in fact, Gaussian mixture models, there's a, there's a work from Christoph Bishop in 1999, and he has, uh, he has proposed the mixture density networks. And then people have figured out that they have terrible mod collapse issues. And so they really, they, they, they want to get rid of reporting the mean, uh, reporting the condition leverage, but in the end, they end up doing that. So we have to have some smarter mechanisms to actually regress Bingham mixture models. 
and this is what I will be explaining. But first, let's just write the density function for with a with a Bingham mixture. So this is one, you know, this is one Bingham distribution, and these are just the contributions of it to the mixture model with the weights summing to one. And just like the the old version, we can now do the MLE estimation over the over the mixture model and just write it like this. And here we have K components, mixture density. Okay. Now the idea is the same. We will have this neural network. We will predict the concentration parameters, the orthogonal matrices, and then the weights, right? And and then if I sum up these different hypotheses, I will be ending up uh, computing the Bingham mixture model. Okay, so how do we predict multi? So this requires two things. First, predicting multi-hypothesis things. So it's a multi-hypothesis network, right? So we have to predict one Bingham distribution per component. And we have to train, be able to train this. So these are two challenges, and I think Metin was also interested in, in some of those. Here is how we train that. So we perform K predictions. It's, it's easy, right? Just your, your neural network has K outputs. And then we predict K things, let's say five, right? And then for, for well, but, but the, the problem is we don't know what to do with them. So we have the ground root label. It's of course, we don't have the label of ambiguities, but we just have one label per that image, right? So for instance, the pose of the pose of the image, the camera pose, right? It can be ambiguous. So the same camera pose will, will appear several times for different images coming from, the, so, sorry, different camera pose will be observed for similar images in the data set, right? Um, this, this is gonna happen during training. We will see those things coming, but the modes themselves are not labeled. So I don't know, where an image is coming from. Well, well, I don't know all the modes that an image is coming, is potentially coming from, okay? That, that doesn't exist. Okay, so what we do is we, we take the true label at that image and associate it to the closest prediction. So we start from random, we do one prediction and take the, take the closest one, um, take the one that is closest to the ground root label, and then propagate the gradient from there. Right, so update the parameters of that. So this is doable. Um, and in fact, this is an EM algorithm. So we are first computing the assignments, right? And then updating the parameters. So E step, M step, E step, M step is going on all the time. Okay, that's nice. Uh, and that's a, by the way, that's an idea from a 2017 paper. It's not our idea. It's in fact, uh, Christian's idea, Christian Ruprecht's. So what happens is this is very related to, for instance, K means like things, right? And therefore it's actually creating a Voronoi tessellation of the posterior distribution. So there are modes and around each mode, there is a vicinity of, of assignments, right? And in fact, we do soft assignments. It's, it's bad to do hard assignments in network because the gradient doesn't propagate back. So we just do soft assignments there. Okay, this is called the relaxed winner takes all approach. In fact, this is what, I, what you see here is a winner takes all approach. Um, and we do the relaxed version of that. And how relaxed? So it's the soft winner takes all. Um, we, you know, we take the, Kate prediction, right? That is closest um, to the label. And then we, we assign a weight to it as one minus epsilon and all the rest gets a weight, a small weight uh, proportional to the epsilon and the number of hypotheses. Okay, so it's a, it's a weighted scheme. It's not a strict winner takes all loss. Good. And we report the uncertainty with the entropy of the resulting distribution. Okay, so the good thing about being a mixture models is um, we have access to all the components. 
right? So if I go here, we have access to all the components. So for each one, I can report an entropy. Okay. Cool. So any questions so far? Although maybe we can wrap it up a little bit because. Oh yes. I, <laughs> people. Oh, I did not tired. check the time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I realize Good. it's quite interesting, <laughs> but you might have lost some of us at some point. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. It Fine. will be oh. on YouTube, so we can read the paper and go back to that. So yes, thanks a good, lot good. for, yeah. Okay. Fine. So because all, after this point, uh, all of them are, are results and images. I don't have anything else. So it will be easy. Um, so we propose, it, propose this data set, which is a, a, a data set for camera relocalization in ambiguous environments. So we have all these shots, which is hard to identify. Uh, you can only do that by identifying the probability distribution of some sort. And the nice thing about this is we, we give you the modes so, so that you can compare the ground truth. You, know, you, you can compare, for instance, how much of the modes have you have covered and we give all the metrics of that in the paper, how to do it. Okay. Um, yeah, I won't go through the numbers, but it's of course better than uh, the rest of the MC dropout and blah, blah, uh, right? I mean, it has to be better otherwise. Okay, so we also have some synthetic data set where you can actually see. So what you can see here, I think this is good. We have, we have some garbage hypothesis here. You know, this is what we predicted actually. And we have some good, uh, good hypothesis here that align with the ground truth. So these are the ground truth poses, right? This is the camera relocalization. But whenever the hypothesis is garbage, the uncertainty is very high. So it's really easy to discard it. And in the rest of the paper, I will just be dis disregarding the hypothesis that did not converge by the uncertainty. So here you see all the results that are, that, that are focusing on the on the cor correct, you know, confident ones and throwing away the uncertainties. Okay, and here the same. And you, you see already that the, the ground truth is, here is, for instance, let me see that, okay, that doesn't happen here. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe later it will come. Okay, so, you know, you get the idea. So there are some nice scenes, for instance, climbing up the stairs. This creates really like an ambiguous thing. And I think it's important to capture where the person could be. And sometimes, you know, MC dropout like, like uh, algorithms, they just predict the wrong mode, right? It's possible. So, you know, the ground truth is coming from here, is, is here and uh, MC dropout, a Bayesian sort of network, approximately Bayesian neural network is predicting something uh, around here. It, it can also predict, you know, some multiple outputs as shown here overlay, but it's really not, uh, but it's really not capturing the mods, the, the correct mods, right? So we also, so we capture these mods, and, but, but, you know, we can also capture the correct mod. So this is, I think it's important. So to be able to capture the correct ground truth, you have to be aware uh, of the entirety. Okay. So this is unimportant, I think. And we can apply it to objects. So pose estimation of symmetric objects. You know, so these are prediction in, in, in different heads. And yeah, this is this is what you get. It's it's yeah. And it can also handle non-ambiguous settings. So if something is non-ambiguous, you get in all the heads the same value. Okay. Yep, this is it. Thanks a lot, Tolga. Well, thanks for thanks for, this, <laughs> thank thanks for bearing up this long talk. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't checking time because you know I was so relaxed about it. <laughs> you can divide it into three talks at least. <laughs> so <laughs> much content, so much great content. Thanks a lot again. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. I guess there were some <laughs> questions during the talk, but if there is any, maybe we can take a couple of. I don't know. It's too late already. People who had to leave had to left. <laughs> so if there are questions, that's fine, I guess. At this so point. I have a, a short question. So when you talk about the symmetric objects, I try to connect it with your hierarchical uh, representation approach. Basically, if you know that some symmetries exist in the, the objects, you can also make use of this additional information. Like when you define these 
neighborhoods, uh, right, Olga? Yes, yes. So that's a good point. I, that's a point I did not uh, have the chance to explain. So in fact, um, if you know the symmetry, so it, symmetry makes everything easy. And rather than easy, it makes things efficient, of course. Yeah. Um, but the, the, all these approaches are, are when we don't know the, 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 the symmetry. So there is a general class of symmetries that we are trying to identify. And we parameterize the class of symmetries by, the, by these hypotheses that we predict. Right, so it's, it can be a continuous, for instance, uh, let's say complete circular symmetry, and we will be discretizing it with 10 you know, rotations, for instance. Discrete symmetry groups will be just represented with a couple of hypotheses and so on. So we assume that we don't know that. Okay, okay. thanks again. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks for listening. I mean, this was horribly long. <laughs> <laughs> it's the wrong adverb. Any, any, anyone else? Uh, okay. Thanks for the great talk. Can I have a quick question? So it's, ahead, the question. it's just, um, can you please comment about computational complexity of Bingham networks? Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's very lightweight. So normally you would predict let's say seven values, right? Just the pose of the object, maybe. And uh, on top, we predict, let's say, K hypothesis, right? So it's K times seven, which maybe you have 10 hypotheses, so it's seventh values, plus we predict the weights, it makes it 80. And we also predict some additional blah, blah. So it's like around 90, 100, right? Instead of seven. So it's really not that hard. It, if you think about it, neural networks predict images, right? So you generate images even. So which are like, you know, there are, there are I don't know, thousands and millions of parameters. So just predicting 100 things is very simple for a neural network. And there are no architectural changes, nothing, nothing more. OK, thanks a lot. Just maybe a question continuing on the generator networks. Um, mm -hmm. Did you plan, or maybe you already applied this to also like generating point clouds or 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 so? So I, want to, yeah, so I want to make the make the following. So I want to make one neural network for generic uncertainty estimation in point cloud in in camera relocalization. So you let's say you have one neural network or or even like a um, old fashioned ransack like approach, which can give you multiple hypotheses. Now I would like to take your hypothesis, input image, and your data set to assign an uncertainty value to each of the hypotheses, regardless where it comes from, regardless how, how they are generated. So there, I'm thinking of really generating things and, and, and measuring the fitness, because rendering the 3D content is there is important. Um, I think this probably I'm not clear. Uh, I'm probably not knowing what I'm saying, but uh, generally, I think it's a it's a good idea to go from yes to 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 be able to generate from this. I think it's a good idea, and it might be the key to um, to to diversity in the models also. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording now.